Hi everybody, welcome back to English 116, and this is for our class for Wednesday, the 2nd of October, where we are beginning to talk about some short stories. And we left off last class talking about A Sorrowful Woman, and we talked about how it has a certain level of depth and complexity that we didn't see in a piece of formula fiction, such as A Secret Sorrow. And we also talked a little bit about the story of an hour, which even though we read the story of an hour after A Sorrowful Woman, it was written before A Sorrowful Woman. So it would seem that it helped to inspire the author, Gail Godwin, when she was writing A Sorrowful Woman. And that said, it always is helpful to know inspiration and um, ways that individuals have been uh, impacted in the in the past i kind of liken it to music that you can enjoy a musician and their song in and of itself without knowing any of the past influences that have impacted them but once you do know about those past influences it's such a, a richer experience so I wanted to talk a little bit about A Rose for Emily today. And one of the reasons why I had assigned that particular piece was because we have an author interview. I unfortunately was unable to find that interview online for free, but it is included in the textbook. And of course you can get a copy of the textbook on reserve. I thought it would be interesting as we're still in the beginning stages of talking about literature, um, understanding how an author can have a perspective about a work that could very much differ from our own perspective, and both could be equally valid. Now, A Rose for Emily was written in 1931, and this is going to be important, much like we've talked about with all of the texts this semester, to get a sense of place. And it's written in a style called Southern Gothic. So, if you are familiar at all with Gothic literature, it basically reached its, its heyday in the 1800s in England with some very famous and iconic texts such as Frankenstein and Dracula and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Though the first Gothic text, or which credit as the first Gothic text, was actually written in the late 1700s, The Castle of Otranto. Uh, poorly written text, unfortunately, but it helped to establish many of the conventions of Gothic literature, that you might have an old decrepit castle, a mystery that needs to be solved, a damsel in distress, um, lots of atmosphere with uh, cobwebs, secret passageways, things of that nature. And the Gothic tradition is what's led to things like our contemporary horror film. So, as you know, I teach a class in the Gothic, so this happens to be an interest of mine. And the Gothic tradition moved to America with authors that you might have heard of before, such as, for instance, um, Edgar Allan Poe. And of course, you know, the idea is that the English settled the eastern part of, or the northeastern part of the United States and they created a new England. Um, so this is where we are today. And then there were some authors who realized that rather than setting their stories in Britain or setting their stories in neutral grounds that the south of the United States was particularly ripe for settings for Gothic literature just because of its very sordid and painful history associated with slavery. And that's where you get authors such as, for instance, Nathaniel Hawthorne, or I'm sorry, such as, for instance, um, uh, William Faulkner. Sorry, I was thinking about Nathaniel Hawthorne because he's coming up soon. Um, but William Faulkner was born and raised in the South and actually had ancestors who were involved with slavery. He's very ashamed of that. And he oftentimes wrote about it. And he wrote about the decaying South because of the way that slavery helped to um, basically rot out the society itself. And rotting and decay and death is very much in the Gothic tradition. So the story plot actually is rather predictable if you were to put it in chronological order. 
I would not at all be surprised if when you were reading this story, you were confused. You're supposed to be. And the reason why, and you may not have even noticed it, is that Faulkner mixes up the chronology. We've got sections of the story, but they're told in a different order. Because if I were to tell you these pieces in chronological order, that in effect, what we have is Miss Emily, who has a domineering father and won't let her date, that ultimately her father dies and she has difficulty accepting his death and will not release the corpse for three days. That she goes into seclusion and then when she ultimately leaves her seclusion, she begins dating someone that her father would never approve of, Homer Barron, in part because he's a laborer and in part because he's a northerner and Emily is from old southern aristocracy that has earned its power and privilege through the institution of slavery, which is now illegal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that slavery or the horrors of slavery have disappeared from society, certainly not in 1931, and one could argue as well for 2024. Well, the idea of Emily dating Homer Barron leads to the community to gossip and ultimately make a determination that uh, when Miss Emily goes to a druggist to buy some arsenic, um, and it's not legal to buy arsenic without providing a reason. She doesn't provide her reason. The druggist supplies the reason, and he says it's for rats. And while the community continues to gossip that perhaps Miss Emily is contemplating suicide, um, and instead of intervening, the community decides to sit back and watch, almost like it's a reality television show. And then we know that Homer, who really isn't the marrying kind, ultimately goes into Miss Emily's house and then disappears. And a few days later, there's a terrible smell that comes from Miss Emily's house. The community is afraid to confront her. So they spread some lime to cover up the smell. And Emily basically goes into seclusion again. And... At this point, Emily is pretty destitute. I mean, she might have the name Grierson, but uh, from an old established family, but her father is dead and, and they don't really have income. And the townspeople, rather intimidated by her, they, they don't want to confront her. So they um, create this long-winded tale about how ultimately Emily's father had loaned the town money and now the town was going to repay it by uh, forgiving Miss Emily's taxes so that Emily wouldn't be embarrassed in trying to admit that she couldn't afford to pay her taxes. And as more time goes on, all of those politicians die and new politicians take their place and uh, the new politicians want taxes, but Emily doesn't want to pay taxes. As um, she says, go talk to Colonel Satoris. He'll tell you I don't need to pay taxes. Uh, problem is Colonel Satoris has been dead for quite a while now. And as more time goes on, eventually Miss Emily passes away and the entire town goes to her funeral more out of curiosity than anything else. They, they talk about her as being a kind of fallen monument because they really want to see inside her house um, where she has been in isolation for years. And when they enter the house, they find a locked door. And behind that locked door, they happen to find, and this is the first climax, which you've probably already figured out if you are hearing the story in chronological order, the corpse of Homer Barron. In other words, that she killed Homer Barron and she kept the corpse. Some of the foreshadowing there would have been when she would try to hold on to her father's corpse for three days. But the second twist in the event that you might have anticipated the first twist is that next to the corpse was an iron gray hair. Um, the hair belongs to Miss Emily. Miss Emily's hair did not go gray until years after Homer's disappearance, which means that she's been lying next to that corpse years after it has decayed. And we aren't given any detail of what happened because anything that your mind can envision would be much worse than any specific um, description that an author could give. And that definitely is 
very much in the Gothic tradition of the macabre with death and darkness and so forth. But it also is symbolic because Homer from the North could represent the new North that earns its money through labor, not through slavery. And Emily represents the old Southern aristocracy that earned its money through slavery. And we see the tension between the two. And in fact, the author Faulkner was asked about this in his interview on a rose. Could this piece be read symbolically? And basically his response is, well, sure, but it was no intention of the author to say, well, Miss Emily represents the, the South and Homer represents the North, that he was just simply trying to write about a story. And he's even asked about the meaning of the title. And at this point of the semester, we know that titles usually have a good amount of meaning, a rose for Emily. And think about all of the symbolic possibilities of what a rose might mean. Um, you think about a flower that also has thorns that could represent Emily, where she's a, a beautiful and delicate thing, but she's also deadly or capable of inflicting pain. Most roses, when people think of roses, they think of red roses. Red can be associated with things like passion, with evil, with danger. All of those are themes within the story itself. We tend to, um, or at least we used to, I don't know if people still do this, preserve roses um, as mementos. They, they would oftentimes flatten them in a book. I myself have done that in the past. One might say that she preserves Homer Baron, um, much like a memento, and dries him out like a, a dried rose. Um, there is the color rose, which is not red or white. It's sort of pinkish. You know, and one might say that red and white are the two extremes. Perhaps red is evil or sinful and white is pure and pink is someplace in between, um, a certain level of ambiguity, perhaps. And we could say that for Miss Emily, because certainly we can't condone her actions, that she has killed Homer, presumably because he would not commit to her. But you may or may not have noticed that the narrator of this story is we, the community. Um, so we get the community's perspective, which could be incorrect about Miss Emily. But one thing we do know is that the community comes off terribly. They're gossipy and self-centered and take a certain level of delight and happiness over the fact that Miss Emily is experiencing suffering. So we learn that the Southern community is not a very positive community through the way that um, Faulkner portrays them. So we've got all of these possibilities of, of meaning. I even think about the past tense of the word rise, rose, and um, the idea that the past rises up or rose up against you, which could be that slavery will never, you know, ultimately be dead because they're, 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 they're always living in the shadow of it as much as they try to bury it. Um, the idea of for Southern aristocracy, it was very common for gentlemen in the room, in particular, to stand up and rise when a woman walked into the room. It's still a convention in things like courtrooms, for instance. I think about all these possibilities, and then Faulkner ends up saying that, well, a rose for Emily is just that the poor woman had no life at all, and it, it's just a rose for Emily, that's all. And I, I find his answer quite unsatisfactory. And I know how arrogant that sounds. Um, no one has 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 um, has found a way, I think, to dispute Faulkner. But I think that we can also come up with so many other interpretations that are even better than Faulkner's answer. And I use this as an example of how subjective the reading of literature can be. And that even if an author themselves says that this is the meaning of their piece, if we can find evidence in the piece, much like a detective looking for pieces of evidence or an attorney looking for pieces of evidence when they're putting together a court case for, um, let's say, a, a defense or a prosecution, if we can find evidence so that it's possible, then it doesn't even matter what the author says. In fact, we could 
have an interpretation that's the exact opposite of the author's. Now, in terms of some of the, the notes below, you can see that I've covered many of the pieces that I, I've already discussed. Um, one of the things that I didn't cover was this idea of Miss Emily buying arsenic and the druggist writing it's for a rat, because one could say that that's symbolic, that Homer is a kind of rat, because we assume that basically Homer was unable or unwilling to commit to Miss Emily, which is why Miss Emily ultimately thought that she needed to kill him. And I know that there's a phrase in there that might lead to some raising of eyebrows that um, he liked men. And it's less about sexual orientation and more about the idea that Homer is, in one way or another, never going to commit to Miss Emily. Um, so we assume when we put together all of these pieces that that decaying house that Emily lives in is representational of the decaying South and the decay that Emily too is living in as she's oftentimes described as a, as a corpse and note how she's living in a kind of dead past when she refuses to pay her taxes. And in fact, we're told that a man of Colonel Satoris's generation and thought, only a man of Colonel Satoris's generation and thought could have invented such a tale. Only a woman could have believed it. So there's sexism that's embedded in here as well. And we see definitely the contrast of the older generations and the newer generations. She refuses free postal delivery, which would have been considered modern day convenience. Um, she writes in calligraphy, she is teaching China painting lessons, even though no one really wants China painting anymore. Um, again, she's stuck in a dead past, literally and figuratively, and suggested that the South itself is stuck in a dead past. Um, notice that she has a servant, and we're told that this is a, quote, Negro, unquote, servant. And yes, the N-word is also used in this particular piece. And there's been a lot of controversy about it. And the reality is that ultimately it is an example of its time period. So I, I'm not much for censorship. I, I, as, as uncomfortable and horrible as the language is, it gives you an idea of how horrible the society was. And the hope, of course, in reading these pieces is that there will be some change for the betterment uh, in the future. And while Faulkner doesn't come out and necessarily say that, we see the consequences of living in a dead past. It's only going to result in, in death and decay. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to point out with A Rose for Emily. And I also wanted to talk about Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And this is also considered to be somewhat written in the Gothic tradition, though it's not nearly as macabre. Nathaniel Hawthorne writing in 1835 about New England. And in order to, I guess, appreciate Nathaniel Hawthorne and this particular piece, Young Goodman Brown, we need to know a little bit about the history of how New England was settled. And basically it begins with the Puritans who were a religious sect in England and they were very extreme in their beliefs, um, very rigid. There was either a good or an evil and nothing in between. There was either salvation or hellfire, nothing in between. It was about living a life of deprivation so that you could be rewarded in the afterlife. And they left England because of some of the religious persecution that they experienced. And they came to America and they formed a New England, New England, which is where we are. And the great irony is that they began to persecute individuals who had different belief systems of their own, calling them witches. So you're probably familiar with the great witch trials in Salem, and this story does take place in Salem. So Nathaniel Hawthorne also has history associated with this area, much like Faulkner had history associated with his area. Nathaniel Hawthorne's ancestors um, were part of the Salem witchcraft trials, and Hawthorne was quite embarrassed and ashamed about it. And 
one of the things that we see in the story is the exposing of the hypocrisy of Puritans and the exposing of the hypocrisy of um, that's associated with with um, Puritanism. And this piece is considered to be an allegory, which means that the entire piece is representational. It's it's symbolic. So when we talk about young Goodman Brown, yes, he's young because he's young, but young also suggests innocent, naive. He needs to learn something. Goodman, he is a good man. At the time, Goodman, though, was a title, much like Mr. and Mrs. Brown. And one could say, well, um, Brown is a common surname, so perhaps young Goodman Brown is going to be experiencing something that will be very common for many of us. Brown is also the color of soil, and this story takes place in the wilderness, the forest, that which is wild and untamed. And definitely it's about the soiling of our souls and the sin that all of us carry, whether we are Puritans or not. And we know that Goodman's going to go on some sort of a voyage into some sort of a journey into the wilderness. And his wife, who is aptly named Faith, because she represents his religious faith, his spiritual faith, his faith in humanity, tries to hold him back and he does it anyway which is already suspicious. Why would he be doing this if he knows that he's not supposed to be doing it? And when he goes into the wilderness, and note that he's been married to Faith for three um, months. Three is oftentimes a Christian symbol. Um, um, so when you think about the idea of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Trinity, and he meets a traveler that perhaps is or perhaps isn't the devil. The traveler seems to have these supernatural powers, but then those supernatural powers are oftentimes negated. You know, so he's carrying a staff that looks like a snake that seems to wriggle, but then it must have been, as I said in the piece, an ocular deception. Or in other words, it should have been my eyes playing tricks on me. And I know that the language is a little bit antiquated, so you're going to have to untangle some of that language. And what we find is that along this journey, it seems that everybody is on the same journey and they're all going to what is seemingly a witch meeting. And by everybody, we mean church leaders, including Goody Cloyce and, and Goodman's horrified. How could Goody Cloyce be engaged in something that could be evil because she taught him his catechism? In other words, this was a Sunday school teacher, politicians and in our cynical society, we might say, of course, politicians are associated with sin. But at the time period in which this piece was written, the idea that church leaders, politicians, professionals, widows, even Goodman's family members could be involved in sin would have been very eyebrow raising. And the fact that Goodman himself is on this journey suggests that he too is involved with sin. This piece is deliberately ambiguous. And when we talked about deconstruction at the beginning of the semester, we had talked about the idea that this literary theory looks for contradiction, arguing that each contradiction in a text negates the meaning of the text, so the text collapses and is meaningless. And deconstructionists love pieces like Young Goodman Brown because in the end, the central question of, was this a witch meeting that happened? Or was it a figment of Goodman Brown's imagination? That question will never be answered. In fact, the author even plays with us and asks, was this a witch meeting or was it a dream? And the response is, be it so if you will. In other words, whatever you want. Uh, the reality is that it, it doesn't matter if it was real or not. What does matter is what Goodman learns and how he's changed. Changed for the worse by what he sees and experiences, that he learns that humanity is just as ambiguous as this story is. There is no complete good or complete evil. We're someplace in between. But what this does for Goodman is that he decides to reject humanity as a whole, which is why he, just, he dies with no hopeful verse upon his tomb. He becomes a darkly meditative man and the lesson for us is not to allow that to happen when we lose our faith, whether it be literal or figurative. And Goodman is convinced that Faith, his wife, is at this witch meeting. He sees one of her pink ribbons. 
but the next morning she's wearing a pink ribbon um i know we could easily explain this that there are two pink ribbons though it would have been much less common at the time period for individuals to own multiples of things but a true Puritan would be dressed in black and white. They certainly wouldn't be wearing color if you've ever seen any of those old pictures of the pilgrims, for instance, during Thanksgiving. So what, what is Faith doing wearing pink? That would seem to suggest that she too is tinged with some level of sin. So the lesson to us, ultimately, because that's what this piece is, is a lesson to us. You know, that evil exists everywhere. It exists within religion. It exists within humanity. It even existed within Goodman. And we shouldn't let it destroy us. So regardless whether we are religious or not, there probably is some point in our lives where we have to come to the realization that the people we trusted have abilities to engage in evil and betray our trust. It could be a parent. It could be a spouse, it could be a friend, it could be a teacher, it could be a politician, it could be a spiritual advisor, it could even be ourselves. And when, not if that happens, when that happens, we shouldn't let it result in our self-destruction the way it does with Goodman. So some of the evils that are exposed in this story are evil indeed about how um, elders of the church are, are, are basically trying to seduce the young maidens, how uh, women who are eager for widow's weeds have given their husbands a drink of their last sleep, in other words, killed their husbands so they could be widows and enjoy the um, opportunities afforded to a widow by inheriting property if there are no heirs and having a certain level of freedom and independence not being married how youths who are so young that they're beerless at this point have basically uh, made haste to inherit their father's wealth in other words that they've killed their fathers and their parents in order to be able to get their um inheritance um, how young maidens have basically dug little graves in the garden and bidden this traveler as the sole observant. And this is the idea of how these supposedly virginal girls have been impregnated and ultimately decide to abort their child or kill their child upon birth. And these are the evil sins that go on behind closed doors at least some of the examples that were given in young goodman brown and think about modern day parallels where we find out the true actions of individuals that have a certain level of respect or, or prestige or, or power or money and then to find out that their lives were very sordid and very different than what would appear on the surface and again, the moral or the lesson to us is not to let that destroy us the way it destroys young Goodman Brown. So those are two stories that I, I wanted you to consider. And next class, I'll, I'll talk about Battle Royal and I'll talk also about Soldier's Home. You can see that in the notes below, I have included links for those. And our last story will be Popular Mechanics. And it's a very short story. It's only about a page or so. Um, but it is a very powerful story. So that's what's going to put closure onto our fiction section. So at this point, um, we're getting closer to your having more options for what you could write a paper about. Um, as you know, you could write on Citizen Kane, but you could also write on A Sorrowful Woman or The Story of an Hour. Or you might want to write about A Rose for Emily. Or you might want to write about Young Goodman Brown. And if you're still not certain, we still have Soldier's Home, Battle Royal, and Popular Mechanics coming up for you to contemplate in terms of your paper.
So I thought that what we could do today for our attendance question is to talk a little bit about language. So we've talked about two stories today, Rose Fremley and Young Goodman Brown. So our attendance question, which will be on our discussion forum, and that'll be due on the 4th of October, Friday, though certainly if you need more time, ask me for an extension, will be for you to identify an important quote in either a Rose for Emily or Young Goodman Brown. Choose one of those stories and choose one quote from one of those stories that you think is important and detail why you think it's important. So what I expect would probably happen is that we'll have perhaps half of you talking about one story, the other half of you talking about another, and because you're all free to select your own quotes, we'll probably have a nice variety of quotes. So this will give us a good idea of some of the important language in the stories, um, what we would have talked about in class, actually, during a class discussion. And while you're not required to respond to your classmates, you are required to read your classmates' responses and my responses in turn. So that'll give you a good background with these two stories. So what we'll do next class is we'll forge ahead and we'll talk about about Soldier's Home and we'll also talk about Battle Royal and we'll talk a little bit more about the paper as well. So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well and we will continue on next class. Take care. Bye-bye.